Good morning and welcome to the VO in Africa. Um, my name is Alberto Skuman. I'm a consultant with the Institute for Security Studies in the Transnational Threats and International Crime Program. Today we'll be discussing the threats of violent extremism in South Africa. Now, historically, this has taken two dimensions, a domestic and an international dimension. With regard to the domestic dimension, we've traditionally seen a threat emanating from the Afrikaner far right and from people against gangsterism and drugs or pagat. Then in the international dimension, we've seen threats from Al-Qaeda and Al-Shabaab and more recently accusations of links to Islamic State. My presentation will follow by looking at these two um, dimensions, then we'll look at some of the government's responses to recent issues and end with some of the recommendations from our research. So I want to start by discussing some of the terms that we've used in this paper because we so often incorrectly use terms like violent extremism and terrorism interchangeably. Violent extremism is not terrorism, it's merely the willingness to use or support the use of violence to further particular beliefs and these can be social, political or ideological and may include the use of terror tactics. Terrorism, on the other hand, is the use of violence or the threat of violence for intimidation or coercion for particular ends. When we talk about how people become involved in these groups, we use radicalization to mean the process whereby an individual becomes susceptible to extremist ideology, while recruitment is the process through which they become actively involved with these groups. The first domestic group that we'll look at is the Afrikaner far right, and it's important to understand that this isn't a uniform or a single group, but rather various groups on a spectrum from conservatism to your more extreme groups. They, however, share a few common themes, the first of these being the concept of folk, which would translate to something along the lines of nation or people. And this is their um, idea of a shared language, history and culture that forms their particular conception of Afrikaner identity. And history plays an important role here, again, because it's their interpretation of history which forms their later ideology. Events such as the anglo boer War particularly play an important role in the formation of Afrikaner nationalism. And you'll see in many of these groups there is this idea of building an independent Afrikaner nation-state which forms the motivation for their actions. At the far end of the spectrum, we have mysticism playing an interesting role in the ideological formation of some of these groups. There is a particular seer from the Boer War era who prophesied a future war between white and black in South Africa, and he believed that following this war, white, would rule, white rule would return to the country. And it's prophecies such as these that form the ideological motivation for groups such as the Burmach. The issues around which the group are gaining support today are the high levels of violent crime we see in the country, issues of poor governance and corruption, the disproportionate number of farm murders occurring in the country, which they are interpreting as white genocide, and surround issues such as these that they have interpreted what they see as the decline of the Afrikaner nation particularly the decline of the role of the language in the country, the prominence of it, uh, what they see as the perceived rise in white unemployment, and they interpret this as the political alienation of the Afrikaner people, and consequently we see resurgent ethnicity and nationalism in certain areas. We do know that some of these groups have been training. The question of training and whether this poses a threat to the country is, however, very difficult to determine. Um, a lot of this training is claimed in self-defense, both from crime and from the apocalyptic notions of the collapse of the um, nation state or the South African state. This, of course, ties back to the notions of mysticism and prophecy. However, we should recognize that these groups are very fragmented and since the death of Eugene to Blanche, they have significantly lost any type of coordination. Further, the Burmach trial and the disruption of subsequent plots has shown the South African state's ability to disrupt and infiltrate these groups, and this has significant deterrent value 
Finally, we must recognize that this is an incredibly small group. This is a minority within a minority. And there's a, any type of sustained activity from these groups would be near impossible for them to maintain. Our assessment is that there will always be a chance for a lone wolf attack or an attack by small groups. The second domestic group that we looked at is people against gangsterism and drugs or PAGAT. Now, Bagat formed in 1995, initially as a pressure group protesting against violence and drugs in the Cape Flats. Towards 96, the rhetoric became increasingly militant, ultimately culminating in the violent public murder of Rashad Stahi. Over the next four years, they would carry out more attacks, becoming more violent, and increasingly attack indiscriminate targets, such as the gay nightclub and, most famously, the Planet Hollywood restaurant in Cape Town. And as the group became more violent, the, the role of religion played increasing importance. And this has been attributed to the role of, or the influence of Kibla on the group. Kibla was a group formed during the apartheid era, predominantly Muslim group, reportedly received training in Libya, and they would bring to Pagat a new element of religion, as well as well-trained individuals and well-coordination a well-coordinated um, group. Between 1996 and 2000, they carried out estimated 472 attacks. Today, again, we see that a lot of the issues around which the group originally um, formed remain prevalent, such as high levels of crime and gang violence in the Cape Flats, and there's still a sentiment that government is not doing enough to deal with this issue. However, we have to acknowledge that the context within which the group op operated post-94 has significantly changed, and South Africa is now far less tolerant of the type of violence we saw during this time. That extremist influence that the group once had is now also gone. The more extreme members of the group have since been jailed. We see now that the group is taking a far more moderate approach, working alongside government and police to deal with the issues that they have. We also know that from a state leaked state security agency document that the government continues to monitor this group. So if there are rumblings of violence, the government would be able to pick up on this and to disrupt this group. Our assessment is that there really is little chance of the group returning to its late 90s activities. The second aspect of my presentation looks at international extremist groups. And there are a few links that I'd like to point out. The first being Kalfan Kamas Muhammad, who was involved in the 1998 embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania, where he planned or prepared the explosives used in the Tanzania bombing. Following the attack, he moved to Cape Town, where he hid out in the country for a year before being discovered. Then we have the infamous case of the White Widow. White Widow lived in South Africa on and off for a number of years under an assumed identity. She is wanted by the Kenyan authorities for her alleged role in an attack in Mombasa in 2012. Further, we have Muhammad Gulzar, who flew from South Africa to the United Kingdom as part of a plot to blow up airplanes mid-flight. And interestingly, he's part of the reason why we are not allowed liquids on airplanes. The final major case that we've seen in South Africa is that of Henry Oka, who was the leader of the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta. And he planned attacks in Nigeria from South Africa, and he was charged under our counterterrorism law and is currently in jail. We've also seen South African passports appearing in a number of countries in the hands of suspected extremists. Um, the most prominent example of this was Fazul Muhammad, who was a prominent member of Al-Qaeda in East Africa, killed in Somalia, and found carrying a South African passport. The examples that I've pointed out now show a, a theme that we've seen in a number of cases of people hiding out in the country amongst the local community before being later discovered and deported. The final instance that we've seen of South Africa's links to extremist groups is that of Islamic South African recruits to Islamic State. From our research, we believe that about 60 to 100 South Africans have joined the group, and about half have since returned. <laughs>
When we look at what drove them to join the group, it seems that a lot of them really bought into the idea of the caliphate. So much of what the public generally sees of Islamic State's violence, we believe that it's just um, about violence and the graphic nature of that violence. But the vast majority of their propaganda is in fact um, focused on the idea of governance and the utopian Islamic State that they're trying to build. In cases such as al Afriki here, who we see on the slide, um, he bought into this idea quite strongly of the utopian Islamic State that the group was trying to build. We should also recognize that the circumstances which led to these individuals becoming interested in this group are very specific to the individual. Contrary to what we see in Europe, where Muslim immigrants generally live in ghettos and are politically marginalized, South African Muslims are quite well integrated, well off, and politically included in South Africa. Finally, it's important to realize that for the South Africans who have shown interest in this group, their radicalization was not against South Africa or the South African government, but rather against the global perceptions of global injustice and a war against Muslims in the Middle East. In many ways, the South African government has responded quite well to this problem. They have told us that they are debriefing people who have returned from Iraq and Syria to differentiate between fighters and non-combatants, as a number of people who did travel there to join the group did so not as, as fighters, but rather were families, women and children. They've been quite careful about stigmatizing communities and to avoid this. The approach that they say they're taking is what they call persuasion rather than prosecution. And this is the idea of involving communities in the reintegration of these individuals rather than having automatic responses that would just jail people. The current threat that this group poses or that international extremist groups pose to South Africa is largely a question of intent. We know that there have been recruiters in the country. We know that there are people who have returned from Iraq and Syria who once showed interest in this group. We also know that weapons are readily available in the country. We can easily look at um, the high levels of violent crime in the country, as well as the ATM bombings that prove to us that weapons are readily available in the country. Like I mentioned, this leaves the question of intent. Now with groups like Al-Qaeda, what we've previously seen is that they seem to lack this intent that they once had or that could have been there. Um, there was always this argument that South Africa is safer or better not to attack because it could be used as a, a safe haven for hiding out and for planning their activities. With Islamic State now, this is a completely different question. We know that this group is far more aggressive and violent in their tactics. In December last year, we saw two suspected members of Islamic State traveling from Iraq or traveling from Turkey to South Africa. And this ra does raise the question of whether this group is now interested in, a in attacking South Africa, particularly now as they lose territory in Iraq and Syria and start losing relevance to maintain their relevance as an international extremist group in the um, global context, they will need to um, carry out more attacks. And this is where South Africa could become a more attractive target as a fairly industrialized country with um, lots of foreign interests. However, as of yet, we haven't yet seen this group posing or, um, a significant threat to the country and there is no clear indication that they are interested from our research, we made the following recommendations. The first is to address corruption. In the case of passports, it's quite clear that corruption is playing an undermining factor in allowing extremists into the country and um, undermining our ability to respond to this threat. Further, South Africa needs to strengthen its response capabilities. Um, countering terrorism and prosecuting these types of crimes is a very um, specific task which requires specified skills. South Africa does, however, seem to be moving towards this direction. Further, South Africa needs to be doing more to strengthen international cooperation. We've heard from various government sources that South Africa does not seem to be co cooperating as much as what it should or taking the issue seriously. By the very nature, a lot of these groups are international and so can only be defeated through international cooperation. South Africa could also be doing more in terms of communication and transparency.
terrorism has, um, the, by definition, has power in creating fear, not just through the act of violence, but the potential for violence. So if you don't dispel that fear that is created by the very idea of terrorism, terrorism still have that effect. South Africa needs to be doing more to be telling its people that they are being kept safe and that South Africa is doing something about this. A uh, lack of communication creates a lack of competence or perception of a lack of competence. Finally, South Africa should be doing more to build social cohesion and inclusivity. A lot of the factors that we would ordinarily consider conducive to radicalization, such as socioeconomic marginalization, political exclusion, and poor governance are prevalent in South Africa. We see these factors playing a role in both domestic groups that we've discussed today. And while these factors generally haven't manifested in um, violent extremism, but rather have taken the form of political violence, such as in um, violent protests, or have manifested in crime, if these issues are left to fester, there's no doubt that they will become far larger issues and that's when we will have more violence. If individuals feel that they can't work through established democratic institutions, that's when they will come to work outside of them and that's when we have violence.